Okay, I think we'll get started now. And first thing is to welcome everybody who has joined us, uh, wherever you are. And um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And as we always say, of course, it will be very much nicer to see you all in person. Uh, I'm Christine Chenkin. I'm Professorial Research Fellow at the Centre for Women, Peace and Security at the London School of Economics. And I'm the Principal Investigator on, our, on an um, ERC advance grant on gendered peace, under which we are privileged to be hosting um, today's event. And I think today's event is going to be a very special um, event. It's a launch and a celebration of the new book by Professor Farida Banda on African migration, human rights and literature. And for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, this is the book. It has got a wonderful map of the continent of Africa on the front with people moving, well, in the form of birds. Are they birds, Frida? You can tell us later. They look like birds. Um, moving um, both to and from um, the continent. Now, the book that we are celebrating is a law book, but I think it's a law book unlike any other that I have ever read. Uh, it shares an extraordinary breadth and sweep of knowledge and internalization of law and legal texts, legal rulings, particularly from various human rights bodies, but it combines it with a depth and a wealth of literature and literary legal re realism through novels, through short stories, through snippets of poetry. And Frida brings together the law, the rulings, the legal texts with the literary texts to tell the stories of African migrants and, and asylum seekers following their journeys of those who leave, those who travel, those who are seeking places of safety and who live throughout their journeys navigating around the law and navigating around those who are looking very deliberately often to exploit, endanger and cheat them, including of course within the states where they are seeking to find such safety and security and stability. And through the pages of the book, the people come alive. They're neither the vulnerable victims that we see so often through human rights texts, nor are they the so-called scroungers, worse words such as vermin, often used by the right-wing media and populist politicians. These are the men and women, children, trans people, intersex people, homosexuals, lesbians, individuals with their own identities, own stories, as they seek to further their potential through their own resources and skills, and yet how they have to continue to live their lives under the shadow of the laws, but so often find that the legal protections and rights are just out of their reach and are unable to provide them with the protections that they are entitled to. Um, the book leaves me humbled and, and in awe. It's a wonderful achievement for Rita. It's post-colonial, it's critical race and feminist text, but I think that to label it with any of these categories that we use as academics denies its very personal attributes found in the various ways Frida draws on her own experiences, on her relationships, particularly her relationships with her father, other family members, and her children to whom the book's dedicated. And the warmth and humor that pervade um, throughout the book, and for those who know Farida, very much part of her personality, but also her anger and her frustration at the yawning gap that exists between the law and reality. Now, I hope that's persuaded you all to um, buy the book and to realize that it really is a very special um, achievement. And I will just say at this point that the publishers, Heart Publishers, have um, off, are offering a 20% discount. If you go into the Heart Publishing website and use the discount code capital U, capital G7, UG7 at the checkout, there is a 20% um, discount on the book. And I'll repeat that um, at the end as well for anybody who would like to do so. 
but um, I think what you all want to hear is about the book from our speakers. And we have a fantastic lineup of speakers. So what I will do is introduce them all first, then hand over to them. And then following a discussion at the end of the presentations, we will also have the chance for questions from the participants, from the audience. And um, please, if you've got questions that arise, questions, comments, things you would like to contribute, um, put them into the chat on Zoom as we go through. So our first speaker is Professor Ambrini Manji. Um, Ambrina is Professor of Land Law and Development at Cardiff University, where she was a co-founder of the Law and Global Justice Centre. Previously, she was seconded to Nairobi as the director of the British Academy's British Institute in Eastern Africa. And in discussion just before we started, I think she was comparing the weather in Nairobi rather better with that uh, in Cardiff. Um, her disciplinary research is focused on law and society in Africa, um, in particular also a work on African literature. And in this regard, she's one of the leaders in the African Feminist Judgments Project, which is hosted at the center. Her most recent book is The Struggle for Land and Justice in Kenya that was published last year in 2020. And Bruna is also president of the African Studies Association in the UK and a co-editor of African Affairs. So Ambrina will speak for around 10 minutes. Um, she will be followed by Dr. Chiloka Bayani. Um, Chiloka is an Associate Professor of International Law at the LSE Law Department. He's currently a member of the UN Human Rights Fact Finding Mission to Libya and a member of the Expert Advisory Group to the UN Secretary General's High Level Panel on Internal Displacement. He's a member of the UK Foreign Secretary's Advisory Group on Human Rights and is a member of, and a member of the UK's PSVI, um, Prevention of Sexual Violence and Armed Conflict um, Steering Board. And Jaloka was previously the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Internally Displaced Person and a member of the High Level Panel of Eminent Persons of the African Union on the formation of an African Union government. So Ambrina and Chiloka in sort of about 10 minutes each will give um, their um, thoughts about the book from their particular perspectives. Following that, we give Farida a um, chance to respond. And um, so to introduce Farida a bit more formally, she's Professor Farida Banda, who um, graduated from the University of Zimbabwe in law, then went to Oxford for her doctoral work on access to justice for women. Um, after working for a period at the Law Commission for England and Wales, she returned to Oxford as a postdoctoral research fellow under the Lever Hume Special Research Fellowship. She joined the faculty at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies, in 1996, where she is now a professor of law, researching and teaching in a whole range of subjects, in particular the human rights of women, law and society in Africa, and family law. Um, Frida has advised, written experts' reports, worked within various capacities with numerous bodies, including non-governmental organizations, governments, and United Nations agencies. Her previous book, Women, Law, and Human Rights, An African Perspective, was also a great pleasure to read and to learn from. So as well as responding to Chiloka and Ambrina and adding any thoughts of her own, Farida will also then move on to introduce two further contributors to the event. Um, the first, in fact, is a recording, a video recording of a reading by Miron Hadero of, of, um, from her short story, The Wall, which is drawn upon by Farida in the conclusion to the book. So she will explain that and then we will hear the recording um, of um, part of The, the Wall um, by Miron Hadero. And then the second, and I understand Frieda's going to be putting questions to him, is Professor John Eekler, who is the Emeritus Fellow of Pembroke College in the Faculty of Law at Oxford University. And as I said, following um, the presentations, there'll be a short discussion between the various speakers and then an opportunity for the audience um, to join in. So I think without any further ado, Ambrina, I'll hand over to you. 
Thank you very much indeed, Christine, for, for your introduction. Good morning, everyone. And it's very good to be here with you all to, uh, to launch and to celebrate Professor Farida Banda's new book. I've thoroughly enjoyed sitting quietly with the book over the past few days. Let me begin by saying a few words about the book's aims as they have been articulated by its author before I set out a few of the questions that the book provoked for me. Um, Farida shows compellingly in her new book how she has come to a better understanding of the modern migration of Africans and others through fictional literature. Uh, beginning in the classroom where she has set and assigned academic readings for her classes, she also suggests how we might usefully supplement these academic texts with fictional works. And there are a number of themes that Farida um, explores, investigates in, in her book. And these include, first, reflections on how the insights of the humanities might supplement our own substantive social scientific expertise in law. Secondly, how she has responded personally, as Christine um, alluded to, to these texts as both lawyer and she herself states as migrant. So it's a book of great warmth and a book of, of great intellectual breath. Thirdly, Farida uh, asks, how might literature help us to think about um, how migrants have to, to, to frame their claims in ways that the law understands? And she draws here on Carol Smart's work to think about modes of inclusion and exclusion and how these might be better understood through fictional representations of the law. So how we might understand how people are forced to operate in the shadow of the law. And then particularly through her study of what she calls the diasporic novel, um, Farida tries to understand better ideas of belonging, um, hierarchies of belonging and notions of citizenship and how they might be interrogated through literary works. So all of those themes in this brief summary um, are concerns in, in her book. Um, but what strikes me very much in reading it is how these questions that she raises as, as questions of academic concern also map onto her own intellectual journey which has, and you'll, you'll, it's very clear to, to read in the book, which has also entailed reflecting on belonging and boundaries and inclusion in her own intellectual work and, and life. By this, I mean that it's palpable how much for this work and how much this book is an exercise in almost in justifying her interest in and approach to literature. Uh, she notes, for example, that she feels almost obliged to explain uh, to her institution and to others why, as a lawyer, she is spending so much time with works of literature and why she is including them in her classroom. And this, for me, raises really critical questions about our own discipline of law and its boundaries of what is and is not considered a legitimate, a legitimate object of study and what the boundaries of our own discipline is and how we, how some of us are determined to push at those boundaries. It's been exactly 20 years since I first wrote on law and literature, specifically on law and African literature. And it's really striking to be reminded by Furry, this book, of the defensive mode in which we still do that work. 
um, we're cast, those of us who want to work in this subfield, we're cast into the role of either, we're cast into the role of, of, a, of a niche or a minority interest. Uh, and how, how is this, how is this um, sense of being cast into a, a niche or minority interest manifest? Well, in the law school, we're uh, presented as or, or come across as the sole quirky humanities facing lawyer. In literature, we're seen as the lawyer seeking to make incursions into a discipline which is not ours. And in law and literature, a scholar working on Africa is only working on Africa. And still, we keep doing the work. So the question for me that, that has always been in my mind and is, is provoked again by reading Farida is, amongst whom then might we seek allies? who are similarly interested in law, in its performance, and in its imagination, and in its imagery. I want to um, sum up my comments by suggesting that we need to look beyond the literary text. So we need to think beyond the novel, the poem, the film, and we need to understand the work that is being done more broadly by literary theorists and literary critics and to take seriously the insights that we can bring back to our own writing and our own classrooms from that work. And I'm thinking here of the ways, for example, in which in Kenya, it's the literary theorists, and Kenya is the context I, I know best, in Kenya it's the literary theorists who have done most to cast light on our constitutional review process, for example, of the last decade, um, on the hope that we've invested in our new constitution and on the limits of what we have achieved. It's the literary critics, not the lawyers, who've done this work. I'm thinking here of an essay that I would point you to as a beautiful study of um, the imagery we've used in our struggle for constitutional change. It's an essay by Wambui Mwangi in the New Inquiry, and it's called Silence as a Woman. And I'll, I'll, I'll put the reference for you in the chat box if you like later. In this essay, Professor Mwangi discusses how Kenyan, Kenyan women have always put their bodies on the line in, the, in political struggle. And it's an essay that echoes many of Farida's concerns in her book because it's a, an essay that's concerned with questions of belonging, of citizenship and of exclusion. Uh, and Mwangi explores a range of, of women in different aspects of public life in Kenya and asks how these women, what these women contribute to our understanding of law. She doesn't explicitly frame her essay this way, but this is certainly my reading of it. So for example, she studies a young woman arguing before the Supreme Court in a presidential election petition, or the imagery that we use when we talk about the 2010 constitution of the Kenyan every woman in the form of uh, Wanjiko at the heart of, of our constitutional imaginaries. And in so, in so doing, um, from a literary theory perspective, I think Professor Monk is asking many of the same questions that Farida is interested in. So that whereas I agree with Farida that lawyers have been hesitant to study law and literature, we must recognize that the same is not true when viewed from the perspective of literary theory, African literary theorists are working to understand our domains. They're working to understand the law and its, its, its um, images, its workings in the courtroom, in the constitution, and it's, they are bringing that work into their classrooms and into their research. So I think in reading for either I, 
was provoked to think that we might we need to be much less hesitant about meeting uh, literary theorists on that ground. And I think for this book has done a great deal to take us one step closer to doing that. Thanks, Christy. Thank you, Ambrina. And thank you for that very, um, I think very, very, um, again, personal, but building upon your own responses, but introduction to this broader landscape that Frida um, is offering. So Chaloka. Well, thank you very much, uh, Christine, for your kind introduction. It's quite a pleasure uh, to be on this panel to discuss uh, Professor Farida's uh, a brilliant book. Um, it's innovative, situated in the method of narrative, which is actually uh, a growing field in academic writing. Um, you know, these days. Uh, but as we do so, uh, I have known Farida for so many years since we we're both students uh, at Oxford. So uh, it gives me uh, a great pleasure to be able to celebrate um, the her book. One sees throughout the book, uh, the influence of Afri African folklore and storytelling, um, which is used to impart knowledge and wisdom uh, through successive generations. Um, you know, this is how uh, Africans return memory um, and also wisdom and knowledge. Uh, at a fireplace in the evening, the grandparents will tell stories that they've been told uh, throughout uh, their generations. So I'm reminded of uh, Elech Ahmadi's uh, The Concubine, in which uh, Elech Ahmadi says, a chicken never scratches the ground with both of its legs simultaneously. <laughs> Meaning, don't do too many things at once, set your priorities. And in this book, Professor Banda has certainly set her priorities right. Um, I'll comment on the book from the point of view uh, of the themes that arise uh, in relation to my own work and teaching. The courses I teach at LSC are on international law and the movement of persons, both within and between states and human rights and the human rights issues and the patterns of movement that the book uh, exemplifies are all very familiar. What is unfamiliar, uh, of course, is the literature and the way in which the interspation between the issues, the questions and human rights are presented in uh, a narrative format, uh, I think is simply exhilarating. Uh, I've never read anything like this before uh, previously. So this is uh, breaking ground. The first theme I'd like to take obviously is movement across the Mediterranean uh, from North Africa uh, to Italy and the island of uh, Lampedusa because this is quite captivating in terms of the drowning of an Eritrean woman uh, off this little island. Uh, and of Libya because Gaddafi uh, had a system of migrant labor, especially in Eastern Libya uh, from West and East Africa, that has always been a pull factor, but also the, the disastrous responsibility to protect that removed Gaddafi left uh, Libya almost uh, lawless with Libya divided between, um, you know, the government of national accord and the Libyan um, national army, uh, and which the fact finding mission at the moment um, is having to, to deal with. Uh, coupled with the fact that Gaddafi also had readmission agreements uh, for taking back, absorbing migrants who had been expelled out of Europe uh, into Libya. So the migrants always knew that there was a subnet. Uh, if you didn't quite make it in there, uh, then you'd be returned um, you know, to, to Libya. Uh, but this drowning um, is exemplified in my own teaching. I usually start my, my class on the movement of persons between states uh, showing students um, a packed vessel of migrants uh, crossing the Mediterranean Sea uh, into Italy and interceptions by uh, the Italian Coast Guards uh, and other European uh, agencies. Uh, and this has continued and Farida very helpfully uh, mentions the case of uh, Hesh Jama versus Italy, uh, which was groundbreaking in this regard. 
Uh, but more recently, this has continued. The Human Rights Committee on the 27th of January in A versus Italy uh, found um, Italy, uh, this was this year, found Italy responsible uh, for the deaths of more than 200 migrants uh, whose boat uh, drowned um, off the coast uh, of Italy. So the story is alive, it's continuing. The Mozambican store away. Uh, stowaways these days can be stowaways by air, but in the early days of migration, stowaways were usually found on vessels, uh, on boats, which was the main method uh, of migration, as it were, uh, and this has continued. Then we speak of histories of migration across centuries, and Farida very powerfully uh, juxtaposes the issue of migration and anti-migration policies and this lying at the heart uh, perhaps of the so-called migration crisis uh, in Europe, uh, particularly between 2015 and 2019, um, when about 5 million persons from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, North Africa uh, sought uh, asylum uh, in Europe. But this pales uh, quite insignificantly when you consider the numbers that Africa has upwards of uh, 27 million refugees and asylum seekers. There's not a crisis there that is spoken of as in terms of uh, Europe because of the African Union Group Eligibility Convention, which again is cited. Uh, Asia has the highest at about 28 million. Uh, Europe stands at 6 million. Latin America and the Caribbean at about 11 million. So the data indicates at least evidence-based approaches to, to the issue of managing migration and responding to migration uh, and the prevention uh, of the so-called uh, migration crisis. Of the major themes touched in the book, um, in the context of Africa, of course, inescapably are slavery and colonialism which were the earliest uh, forms of migration. Slavery essentially coerced migration um, out of Africa um, into the global north, uh, if you like, um, but also the intra-Africa Arab um, slavery. Uh, colonialism, the epitome of European migration uh, based on conquest and subjugation concocted at the Berlin Conference, 1884 uh, and 1885. Um, and in Farida's book, this rhymes with, uh, of course, Ravi is lyrical uh, about the injustice created by the idea of borders, citizenship and sovereignty, which determine how a person's humanity is measured. And certainly this seems to lie at the center of inhumanity uh, in Africa. The creation uh, of citizens in imperfect, ill-fitting nations, um, you know, subsequently legalized uh, as the sacred trust of civilization under the League of Nations international law justifying colonialism. But while European colonialism uh, in Africa and beyond is seen, Farida makes the point, is seen by some as central to modern migration story. Um, she makes the point that it is not the only story. And the book cites the Persian folk story, uh, the King's Ring, in which we learn now Queen Shabu Banu has a slave girl called Zura, who was as brown as a date, uh, for she was from Africa. The Persian folk story may not have been coincidental. Uh, it is exemplified by the emergence of the passport first in Persia around 450 BC, uh, and people moving out and into Persia as a result, including from North Africa. And of course, enough in, in, in England, the passport images around 1414 um, under Henry V, uh, signaling the movement of persons and of diplomatic protection, especially of the rich abroad. Um, in Farida's view, the rich global north will have unfettered freedom of movement, and those from the poorer south with little to no freedom of movement. A point echoed by Philip Austin as well in his depiction of diplomatic protection. Uh, which in his view arose to provide protection to rich Western nationals abroad, uh, investors, explorers, and business people uh, and others. 
Farida makes a powerful point of navigating the law, which is cast as a shadow, hostile, menacing, unwelcoming, um, which has to be circumvented or avoided altogether. And here, one only needs to start by looking at the definition of a refugee under the 1951 Convention, a person who has a well-founded fear of persecution on grounds of race, nationality, uh, religion, uh, political opinion, or membership of a particular social group, uh, and who is no longer willing or able to remain under the protection of their own state and uh, outside the country of origin. <laughs> that definition itself uh, is, is, quite, uh, uh, is, is quite intimidating, confronting it. Asylum seekers you know, don't know that. But the point I'd like to make here is that there's the visible law versus the invisible law. The 1951 convention, the instruments cited in the book uh, are obviously the visible law. Um, but the process of asylum and of the entry uh, of migrants is often invisible uh, behind scenes. And it is dealt by the invisible aspects of this law and the way in which uh, it is applied by immigration officers. And in the context of Europe, it only becomes visible again if there's a human rights issue uh, related to the way in which uh, a migrant or asylum seeker has been treated uh, and the application to the European uh, Code uh, of Human Rights. This is an experience that I, I have seen in the context of uh, providing expert uh, evidence uh, to asylum seekers and processes, which then takes me to Farida's citation of Ter the late Terence uh, Ranger's uh, competing stories uh, in this regard that usually uh, immigration officers see a complete different imagery in relation to an asylum seeker or migrant uh, and in relation to where they come from. Uh, and the whole process of um, interviewing um, is full of um, the catchphrases that uh, Farida indicated uh, in relation to you know, how to um, behave when you're applying you know, for a visa. But the one continuing trend here that I have seen, uh, and which again is not visible, is of the family as a persecuting agent in relation to young girls in the family. Most of the expert witness reports um, that I've been asked to, to look into uh, involve abuse of young girls by uncles or brothers or even fathers within the family. Uh, and of this, again, in relation to a family owner, expose uh, all of this. And most of these um, have dealt about maybe three, four similar cases. Uh, the girls then uh, flee and seek asylum. Um, and the question is, in, in most of the um, uh, deliberations, is this actually a case uh, of concern in terms of um, seeking asylum? Um, and the reports that I have done at least uh, have succeeded in convincing the immigration authorities that this is an issue uh, to take seriously uh, in the context of um, uh, refugees and asylum seekers. The book uses fictional works to understand the causes and consequences of human rights violations such as trafficking. Uh, and here, special rapporteur, I came face to face uh, with issues of trafficking and smuggling. Uh, of IDPs in particular uh, in the Northern Triangle, um, Honduras, El Salvador, Mexico, um, but also in Haiti um, because of the lack of effective protection in Haiti and because of the activities of criminal gangs that target women in particular in the Northern Triangle. Uh, and a young girl who had been uh, smuggled across uh, had come back, deported from Mexico uh, she had been raped, got pregnant, uh, lost her pregnancy along the way, and clearly uh, needed medical care and attention. Or of a Syrian a woman going to Brazil, because Brazil has introduced diplomatic visas uh, in terms of promoting access um, in humane conditions for asylum seekers. And they on their way to Brazil, high in the mountains, when her husband slipped, fell into a ravine and died and she was left alone at the mercy of traffickers and, and smugglers. And this story reached us 
uh, we had to ask the Honduran authorities to pursue, found them, uh, retrieved her, uh, UNHCR, give protection to give a safe house, uh, and then resume uh, her journey to uh, Brazil uh, properly. So this is the stuff of things of, of slavery. Gore Island in Senegal is quite a reminder of what slaves had to go through, a deep hole from which there was no return. Once slaves went in there, it was so narrow that only the head and the shoulders fitted, um, and it was on a downward slope, so you couldn't try and go back uh, so much so that when Mandela saw that uh, particular um, installation at Gore Island, he broke in tears. But we have immigration, migration all over. I visited Ellis Island in New York uh, to see how early migrants uh, in the US were treated. Um, and there's a museum there for anyone who is interested, uh, complete with reception rooms, uh, interview rooms. Uh, and from there, and the posters that are in that particular museum, uh, you see the emergency of identity in the context of migration. Uh, you had Europeans out of Italy, Germany, Scan the Scandinavian countries, Ireland, um, going into America as a new nation. You had, of course, Africans who went there uh, as slaves, um, Latin Americans as well. But it strikes one's um, eye in terms of the narratives that the white Americans are Americans. There's no European Scandinavian America. Um, the black Americans are Afro-Americans. Um, the Latinos are Latino Americans. So the, the idea of belonging, of citizenship of the others is qualified by the nomenclatures, whereas the idea of belonging on the part of the others is not qualified at all. Uh, and you find these hierarchies um, in almost uh, every society where you're dealing with, uh, with migration and with the conviction of Derek Chauvin in relation to the killing of uh, George Floyd. Um, you know, this is a real issue captured, uh, I think, in Farida's uh, quotation of the UN Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent in the US, that contemporary police killings and the trauma that they create are reminiscent of the past racial terror uh, of lynching um, in the United States. Slavery still continues, as Farida's book indicates, in relation to Mauritania, Niger, Hadijatu versus Niger, a decision by the ECOWAS court still stands in relation to slavery uh, in Niger. Then I come to histories of home, identity formation, I am home, um, including Al Mazlui, who is quite influential in Farida's approach uh, in terms of the diaspora of colonialism the diaspora uh, of enslavement. Although the one little quarrel I have with uh, Ali Mazrui is that he did not actually address um, Arab slave trade in relation to Africans. It's a topic that you always refused uh, to be drawn into. Uh, but Shalika, here, could you be winding up? <laughs> yes, I'm, 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 I'm actually coming up to, to wind okay, up. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so on the question of migrants and home, uh, Farida here, uh, quotes uh, Schumer on a return visit home to, to Blawayo and found that while well, some things remained the same, some things have changed. And I think the experience of a migrant here is that you're caught up in a time warp. You remember the society you left, but in fact it has changed. <laughs> uh, and, and you need adaptation when you get back. And yet in the society to which you belong, you're also forced consistently to adapt and almost to, to justify yourself. So I end um, with um, this particular aspect uh, of um, the experience of a young scholar that Farida uh, quotes in the book, um, Amon, his experience, uh, whether he was a living experiment, if yes, what was the hypothesis? Um, and Apaya says, we cannot know for sure, but it may have been, could this boy learn in the European way and contribute to scholarship? The answer is a resounding yes. Amo gained the first degree in law and then a master's, writing his thesis on the European law on slavery, um, 
on the law of the Moors. He then went on to obtain a doctorate in philosophy, becoming the first black African to do so. And I think this was the experience of academic migrants in the early days. Can this person actually write <laughs> uh, in a scholarly way, in a way that is up to European or American standards? Uh, but I think what Farida's book shows is that people can write in different ways. Uh, they can use narrative born out of their African experience um, and contribute excellently uh, to academic literature. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry to have, uh, we could have heard, listened to all of you for so longer, but obviously we're time constrained and you have such a wealth of um, experience and background to draw on. So Farida, over to you. Um, thank you very much. In Shona, we say, which literally means know where you have come from or tomorrow there is darkness. So to my parents, I thank you and I think of you. Um, I just wanted to start by saying that because the book was inspired by the death of my father um, who loved reading. And we read a lot of the same books and we talked about them. Um, and I miss him and I thank you for the opportunity to, that you've given me. I hadn't planned on any book launch until I was having a conversation with Christine. And she said, so when we have the book launch, I was like, which book launch would that be, Christine? <laughs> uh, she said, the one that we're having for you. And I said, oh, okay. And now that we're here and I see who is here, I feel enormously grateful. And the reason I feel grateful, it feels like a life cycle. Um, my life cycle has come round because you probably don't know this, but I've noticed that my former headmistress from high school, who also died sadly um, a couple of years ago, um, Stephanie's here. So hello, Stephanie, on behalf of Mrs. Twiss. Um, I want to say uh, thanks to Maeve, to Marina, um, and then to all of you here, John, Chaloka, Ambrina, and I'm just going to now um, get on with the business at hand, which is, um, I wanted to respond with gratitude to the perceptive comments that Ambrina has made, but I also wanted to start actually by saying how much her work has been in, has influenced me. Um, and it's not a common thing to acknowledge, but I have had a crush on Ambrina for the longest time. If you have crushes on academics, uh, Ambrina has been a huge crush of mine. And the reason Ambrina has been such a huge crush of mine is because she is the one who gave me the courage by virtue of having done this work before to actually embark on a writing project like this. So I'd read, I'd read obviously lots of novels and uh, books and, um, and, and sorry, and poetry. But when I started looking into law and literature uh, books, they were mostly by um, Western academics and specifically uh, by blokes. Um, and then I started to doubt myself. And then of course I remembered, ah, but our pioneer, Ambrina, has, as an African woman, written actually about law and literature. And it was in returning to her work and specifically um, a paper that she wrote um, on Chinua Achebe's Arrow of God, that everything clicked into place. And in this article, um, Ambrina takes um, Achebe's metaphor of like a mask dancing. And she says to, pre to properly appreciate a mask dancing, you have to walk around it. And Ambrina uses this as the jumping off point to talk about the importance of decentering law as in state law, of seeing plurative, plural normative orders, um, what Sally Falkmore calls semi-autonomous social fields. And she talks about how African writers have actually always taken a plural legal approach um, in their writing and in literature. And it was funny because straight after that, I read um, Adonia's um, Silence is My Mother Tongue, which is set in a Sudanese refug uh, refugee camp. And it is the, the novel is interspersed with what he calls trials. Um, and what is fascinating about that is clearly the trials are not those that are put in place by um, state courts, 
um, and yet the people actually abide by the rules and the decisions that are made. And so after that, I came up to um, Kasrabi, um, who's an um, Iranian Swedish now. He's just he's, he has asylum, um, and he was has and he's an academic as well, and he's written this wonderful book in ethnography and autoethnography actually called Illegal. And he introduced me to this idea that there is state law, uh, so refugee law, immigration law, all the things that Chaloka has been talking about. But there's also this idea that I kind of derived from his work, which is smugglers also have law. And I thought actually from Ambrina's legal pluralism, I started to think about the many places that one finds law that one wouldn't necessarily look for it. And I thought about the domestic worker who actually has no labor regulation into, uh, uh, coming into her life, but actually is subject to the law of the person who employs her, and it's usually her. Um, and all this came from Ambrina's dancing, you know, uh, uh, you have to move around a mask. And the other thing that I also loved about Ambrina's work is there's another piece that she writes on uh, Ngugi, Wationgo. And she talks about how he chooses to write in Gikuyu, um, partially as an act of resistance, but also because it's about communication. And I think this is one of the things that lawyers and legal writing doesn't necessarily do, is to reach out and to speak to the people who are supposedly the target audience. And so Ambrina says that the fact that the Kenyan government's response is only to focus on English and um, and, and Swahili as, as you know, the two recognized languages is in itself a breach of the rights of minorities and everybody else. And I thought that's so interesting because one of the ironies of post-colonial Africa is the fact that we all still communicate in colonial languages. We all still hierarchize knowledge in terms of colonial languages. And so I was really fascinated by this idea that Ambrina um, actually had the foresight to interrogate this. Um, um, as a human rights issue in terms of, you know, what is, what is language? And also it links up with the whole point, I think, of, of kind of law and of any discipline, which is about um, communication. The other thing that I suppose um, moving on in terms of, Ambrina and I actually also probably have a little difference of opinion on indirect rule, uh, but I think we can leave that this is becoming a bit specific. So I think we can leave that for a private conversation some point, Ambrina. So I just wanted to really pay tribute to Ambrina's own work and, and to say how much it influenced my thinking and gave me the courage. And I think this is important. And I think Ambrina probably underrates how much um, her pioneering spirit um, encourages the rest of us and girds our loins and makes us feel able to do things. So I just wanted to pay tribute to you and to acknowledge that. I think your um, response to the book was also very interesting, I think, in terms of pointing out the work that's been done by African literary theorists in terms of engaging with law. And I think you've skewered something that I have myself um, been very uncertain about, and this is one of the challenges of, a, of writing a book on migration, because to a certain extent you're following your subjects from home to where they're going. And so do you focus on law and practice on the continent, um, and also literary theory on the continent and how it reflects and, and responds to law there, um, or do you kind of start to look to where people are going and have gone? Um, and so I also felt that I had a foot in both camps, but absolutely you and I must write about Wangi together. Um, and also, uh, uh, I think she's reflected in the book, actually, the, the percept, perspect, per, excuse me, perspective that you gave in um, one of my favorite quotes that I use, I think, in the first chapter from uh, Maya Angelou, uh, her autobiography, The Heart of a Woman, where um, African women are sitting up in North London and it's a group of ANC, African National Congress women and some Kenyan women. And they say, what are we doing here? Have we just been brought, and excuse me, this is a direct quote, brought here as port portable pussy, or are we here also? And the, uh, the, the Kenyan woman says, we, we have fought um, um, for our independence. Um, and so we also have um, agency. So I think, you know, there is actually a lot for us to explore about law and literature on the continent. And so thank you for opening that perspective up for us as well. Um, and my brother Chaloka. Chaloka is probably the person I've known longest here 
uh, when I arrived in England in September 89, I think he'd had a note from somebody that we both know, Alice Armstrong, to look after me. And so he duly wrote me a note um, saying he would drop in. And for my students who are thinking, why do people write letters? Well, it's because um, there were no mobile phones. Uh, so he came to find me and we've been firm friends ever since. He has his weaknesses. He thinks the Zambian side of the Victoria Falls is the better one, uh, but clearly that's that's not true. Um, everybody knows the Zimbabwe side is, is the best one. But one of the things that I've always admired about Chiloka is he is actually the person who's worked on refugee and immigration studies for the longest time. His thesis was on this area. Um, and one of the conversations that I remember um, having with him is when he was special rapporteur for in, um, IDPs, internally displaced people. And I said, well, Chiloka, what's the point of writing all these reports? Does anybody ever read them? And he says, actually, yes, they are read, especially by governments and their influence in terms of uh, donations um, uh, and also humanitarian assistance. And I remembered that conversations. And one of the things that I've done with the book is I spent a lot of time with special rapporteur reports and special procedure mechanisms. And I have come to love the work of the uh, United Nations Working Group on peoples of African descent. And we're actually in the middle of a decade on people of African descent from 2015 to 2024. And the reports of the UN Working Group on peoples of African descent are fascinating. Um, to pick one country visit to Italy, I learned about Renaissance art, um, I learned why it is that so many pictures have little black children dressed up in kind of Western clothing. I learned about discrimination. I learned about um, people, how people arrive, all the things that Chiloka talked about. Um, but I also learned that, you know, the footballer Balotelli um, suffers discrimination, including in Italy. So there's no status protection for you uh, by virtue of being wealthy. Special Rapporteur reports actually are also can be very lyrical. So there's a beautiful one written two years ago now by the UN Special Rapporteur on extrajudicial killings, um, where she looked at migrants and uh, the backlash and this um, Italian threat to prosecute um, people who are helping migrants. And she invokes um, a, a letter written by um, a Jewish organization in France that said it is all our duty, it is our duty collectively to resist unjust laws. And so you ask yourself um, how much we can, we well, you say to yourself how much we can learn. And then there's the special, there's the um, UN working group report that Chiloka talked about in terms of the visit to the United States, which was 2016. And that actually anticipated the George Floyd case and also said that it's important in terms of speaking up um, uh, in terms of injustice. I think the human rights dimension that I drew from all of this was that there is a collective violation of human rights, both by African states um, whose people feel obliged to leave. And you ask yourself how inhospitable the home environment has to be before somebody will jump on a boat um, or you know, traverse the Sahara um, uh, and take these leaky boats. And the second thing I think that came up that I thought was very, very interesting was the disconnect between Western PR about how they're human rights compliant and these constant lectures to people in the global South about how they need to be human rights compliant and the willingness to flout and to violate human rights um, of the uh, migrants or uh, asylum seekers. And the other thing that was very interesting to me was the fact that um, linking back to special rapporteurs and to special procedure mechanisms, how Western governments seem to be offended and affronted when they were called out on their violations. So for example, the UN Special Rapporteur on uh, uh, Contemporary Forms of Races in Tendayu Achiumi visited the United Kingdom two, three years ago. And the United Kingdom government basically wrote a counterpoint and they said, well, she, she didn't understand our conditions. Uh, when the Special Rapporteur for Violence Against Women came, they said, doesn't she have other countries to be looking at? So this was fascinating because it seems that the response 
um, and also when Philip Alston came to uh, the United Kingdom as Special Rapporteur on um, Extreme Poverty, and when um, he was in the United States as uh, in his capacity as Special Rapporteur. So it seems that from a Western perspective, human rights are not here to be applied within Western societies. They're there to be applied elsewhere, and elsewhere is in the global South. And so if the attitude is human rights are for everybody else, then what we start to see is that there's a breakdown of this idea of human rights as protective because nobody takes responsibility. So that's part of what I've learned from the many years of talking to Chaloka about the work in terms of the work that he does is everybody um, acts like it's a, it's a hot potato at people, but they, but they forget that they're human beings at the end of this who are being passed from pillar to post. Um, so I think the literature actually does something which I found quite um, comforting, which is it treats all these, it's basically a, a lack of, a, a breach of promise, but it does so with enormous humor. And that's one of the things I quite liked about, about using the literature. I think these people navigated really difficult circumstances um, with enormous humor and also chose to take alternative legal uh, paths. Um, to go back to Ambrina's work. So I'll pause there. I'm sure there'll be other things to talk about later. Oh, Christine said about uh, the cover um, earlier on. Well, it's funny because on the, this morning on the radio, I was listening to uh, the news program and they were saying that the African swallows have arrived uh, in their migration. So actually the cover is African swallows uh, flying across. And um, so that was the inspiration and, and Hart did a really good job of, of translating that. And my younger, my older daughter, I think, thought it um, was the person who designed it. Um, Christine, shall I do Meron? Yeah, now? okay. I was gonna say it makes it a perfect timing for the book of the African Swallows have arrived um, at the moment. Um, yeah, if you could move on to introduce the video recorder, although I would just like to note that I think you must be the only person at their own book launch who celebrates other people's work <laughs> um, in such um, full and warm detail, which says so much about you as well. Um, but yeah, if you could move on to introducing um, the reading and then um, John. Okay. Um, okay, so in the last chapter, in the conclusion, even, I think that's what they call last chapters, um, in the conclusion, I chose to use, to focus on two stories. One was by uh, Meron Hadero, whose picture has just come up, who's very interestingly, um, an Ethiopian American uh, woman, um, who is also a lawyer. So she's a Yale trained lawyer but she no longer practices law. She has become a full-time writer. And so she's done the Iowa Writers Workshop. And we met actually, um, she's holding the book um, at the Kane Prize um, in 2019, which saw us co-hosts. And she was one of the finalists. And, one of, and the story that she is going to read from is called um, The Wall. And I use Meron's story of the wall as a counterpoint to John Lancaster's um, novel, also called The Wall, also out in the same year, 2019, um, and uh, uh, shortlisted for the booker. To give you some context, Meron's family actually left Ethiopia and initially went to um, Berlin. And so the connection, and then after Berlin, they left and they went to Iowa. And so the connection with Herr Weil is he was actually um, a, ge a German emigre. And so she spoke only Amharic and German. And so when she arrived in this place, the only person that she could communicate with was Herr Weil. And so he befriended her and her family and he invited her to his house every week um, to teach her how to speak English. And so his way of connecting with his background was to go um, to for Armistice Day every year um, to the library and the librarians were given free reign of the entire German collection. So they're looking at these maps and she points out where she used to play with her friends. And that's when Herr Weil makes the point that um, the problem with the wall, the wall being the Berlin Wall, is whichever side you're on, east or west, it casts a shadow on, on you. And I, 
like this analogy because it reminded me of um, a piece that I'd read, a book that I'd read actually by um, French um, feminist Christine Delphi, in which she also talks about uh, French policy um, in terms of the ones and the others. So the ones are the ones who belong and the others are the, you know, the people outside. And between Maron's wall, which leaves people somehow disenfranchised, cold, uh, so the building of the wall doesn't actually protect you. Um, it just leaves you alienated in a way. Um, I linked it up with, and I contrasted it, I suppose, with um, John Lancaster's book, The Wall, which is, a dystopian novel and it's about an island and I think it's England um, that is guarded by uh, what they call defenders and what they're defending against are the people who are um, incomers, so the others. And so between Meron's story of the war, John Lancaster's dystopian vision of an island nation that has defenders who defend against the others linked up with Christine Delphi's um, thesis about the way French um, society operates about some people are considered the ones, whereas everybody else may be considered the others, although there's this pretense that everybody's the same. One gets actually an, an impression of societies that are not so much in crisis, but I think are lacking in empathy and humanity. And the lovely thing about Meron's story and her connection with Hair Vile is it's intergenerational, but it also tells us something about the possibility of human kindness and our own individual agency in terms of how we respond, regardless of what the state is saying or doing. And one of the things I, I found really helpful uh, and I enjoyed about writing the book um, was to focus on how many good people doing positive things they were. Uh, so Bill Knight, I don't know if Bill's here, um, was, is a photographer, he's a lawyer also. It's all these lawyers who've abandoned law. Um, and he's a photographer, so he took some beautiful pictures of refugees, but these were uh, refugee people who had agency and autonomy um, and who were not broken. Um, and there is something there about dignity restoration. The other thing I did with the book um, in terms of the first chapter when I was trying to justify why it is that I come to write about law and literature is I wanted to expand it beyond literature to think about the, multi the multiple forms of expression. So I looked at photographs, um, art and painting, but I also looked at the work of academics in terms of what they had done um, to talk about justice um, and to speak to human rights violations. And the person um, whom I wrote about in the, in the section on academics is actually uh, my hero and my mentor, um, John Ikala. And many of you know John as a family lawyer, an English family lawyer. But I have enormous respect for John and I'll explain why. Um, John was born in South Africa, but grew up in Zim, like me, um, was called Rhodesia, he was very bright, got a scholarship, got the Rhodes Scholarship, went to Oxford, um, was invited uh, to stay on as a fellow, and in 1965, the Rhodesian regime um, decided to unilaterally declare independence, and in so doing, they were just replicating the apartheid model, and John warned before that this would be the wrong thing to do. And then the Rhodesian regime set themselves up in terms of um, constitutional and judicial um, changes. And so one of the things that John did, and he doesn't know this because he didn't know this when I wrote the book and he wrote, read everything in the book. Um, I had what I called a prohibited paragraph and the prohibited paragraph I had in the book is on page 45 and 46, in which I pay tribute to the work that he did in 1960s, in the, in the middle 60s, middle to late 60s, in which he decided to speak to the Rhodesian uh, judiciary to write multiple articles um, to challenge these injustices. And the reason I wanted to honor him in this way is to remind us all that we have it in our power to speak truth to power um, and that 
those who may actually be the ones who may be the beneficiaries of privilege. So John was a white man. He would have been one of the beneficiaries um, could speak. So John, I wanted to say thank you, but also to invite you to tell us a little bit about why you felt this need to resist. Oh, you're, yeah. mute. you're muted, John. You have to unmute, uh, Sarah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, Frida, thank you for what you've just said, and um, particularly for uh, conferring on me the privilege of being included among those people whose work you mention in your, your wonderful book as having, in, in some way, enhanced awareness of the need for and the role of uh, principles and norms uh, when authority is exercised. And of course, your wonderful book itself uh, is an example of doing this uh, enhancement of awareness. This is what your book does. And uh, if I may say so, it's a fitting addition to all your other activities, which we all know about, but I'll mention not just in the teaching that you do, um, but also in your, your, your extensive involvement and engagement in organizations and groups whose work is directed at promoting these norms. But you know, as for me, well, my contribution, um, as you've mentioned, it, it grew out of the constitutional crisis, uh, uh, which resulted in the unilateral by the Southern Rhodesia government in 1965. Now, the politics and the legalities were actually uh, quite complicated, but uh, the bottom line and the simplicity of it really was that the Southern Rhodesia government wanted independence from the UK on uh, terms which would have uh, enabled them to uh, indefinitely, to postpone, you know, perhaps even indefinitely, the advent of African majority rule, or even, and I think this was behind it as well, to introduce a fully fledged apartheid type system on the South African model. Now they couldn't do that in the current constitution they were operating under the 1961 constitution. So they wanted power to do that. Now when of course the UK government refused uh, to give them uh, uh, independence they simply uh, declared themselves independent. And I remember they said, we give to the people, we give to ourselves this new constitution. They just gave it to them. Um, uh, and the new constitution would have enabled them to achieve those objectives. Well, you ask why I became interested. It just seemed to me to be so obviously wrong. I don't think I analyzed the reasons why at the time. But it seemed to be obviously wrong morally, politically, and in any area. Way. Uh, my initial involvement uh, in this was aimed at trying to devise some sort of constitutional scheme which would have led inexorably to African majority government by a gradual process of transfer of power. But this didn't get anywhere. So uh, you had the unilateral declaration of independence. So the next issue was well, how do judges deal? with uh, an executive that has effectively staged a coup d'etat. Now, this raised uh, many difficulties uh, um, of, uh, a of a jurisprudential nature uh, about the concept of legal validity. I mean, if the validity of a law derives from the constitution in which that law operates, but then that constitution vanishes, can there be no more valid laws? Can courts not uh, uh, apply any law as being valid? If they can do so, where does the, the validity derive from? Um, and if they can, are they then bound to accept anything that the revolutionaries pronounce as being law, um, simply because the revolutionaries have that power, as it were, uh, the power 
to enforce it. Now, in, in, in the event, the Rhodesian court, the Rhodesian judges, and not just them, there were some other constitutional uh, courts uh, at that time, accepted that outcome. They accepted, in essence, that whatever the, the people in power, the most powerful people, proclaim as being law is law and should be applied as such by the courts. That was the outcome of that litigation. It was very common. I mean, I put it simply that that was the best. Well, I was bold and perhaps rash or perhaps even young, I don't know enough, to disagree with this and to try to argue, and I did this in a lecture uh, on one of my visits to then Rhodesia. John, you're fading. Sorry. Um, and I did this in one of my uh, lectures, in a lecture on one of my visits to Rhodesia, which was attended by, uh, by some of the judges uh, in the court. And I try to argue that that outcome did not follow, did not follow that simply because um, the executive had power that it was effective, that anything they could do would therefore be uh, uh, legitimate. So where did the legality and validity come from if it, if, if it did not come from that, that effective government? Well, I try to argue that there are many case, cases, and lawyers will, will know that, um, where courts look to principles outside their own legal jurisdiction as um, constituting uh, the building blocks or perhaps even the substance of legal principle. I mean, it's not uncommon for courts to cite decisions in other jurisdictions. I give some examples in, in this lecture, which has been published incidentally in, in, in the collection of essays. Um, there are quite a lot of cases where a court will say, well, you know, this American decision, or this decision of the Supreme Court of Australia, or even um, common law courts citing civil law writers, or even judges, I've seen them, they, 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 they quote, um, sometimes quote academic texts, uh, or uh, I've seen them quote uh, Plato on judgment and another, the, 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 the political theorist John Locke. And these all, they are quite happy to see as constituting, building up legal principles. Now, if they can do that, it's therefore seeming to me to follow that there were legal principles which they could draw upon, uh, which could enable them to decide on the legality of revolutionary actions. Um, they didn't, they weren't saddled with having simply to say, well, the old constitution's gone, we've got this new effective one, we've just got to do what the, the, the new people in power say. There was scope, there was principal scope for them to uh, draw upon these, uh, these principles. They were, could be seen as constituting legal principles. And I gave some examples. Um, one was. Uh, Sorry, John. Christine looks like she's going to send. She's going to invoke some revolutionary principles on the on both of us. Well, uh, <laughs> well, I just mentioned two. No, no, yeah. I mean, take a few more minutes, John. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, we are going to have to finish fairly soon. Yeah, yeah, uh, just, just two. Yeah. One uh, was that government must be on the basis of the consent of the governed, and the other, there are many. Uh, human rights principles, uh, at, even at that time, there was a declaration of elimination, 63 declaration of elimination of racial discrimination. These could all be principles which could form the basis of deciding whether uh, executive acts and revolutions were valid or not. Uh, and if enough judges took this view, it's possible that they could affect the outcome of at least that was my argument then. Um, I still believe that. Uh, that's what I think you've got to say. Then. Thanks, John. Are you coming back in for Ida at this point? No, thank or? you, Christine. No. Okay. okay. Um, I think what we're seeing is just the extraordinary richness, both of the book, the many issues it raises, the interaction between law and literature in the classroom, 
in academia more broadly, in politics and in the, you know, in the real world out there where migrants are facing, as Chiloka pointed out so um, forcefully, just horrendous um, reactions from governments. And I think John's last point reminds us as well of the important role of judges in holding truth to power and ensuring that the human rights principles that we all have are given real actual weight um, and uphold people's positions. Now, I was going to open up discussion and I was going to take questions from the floor, but we have literally just about five minutes left and we do have to close at this point at uh, 12 o'clock. So what I think I'll do is I'll point people on the chat to an essay that Amrina has just put up that she recommends on everyday resistances, which sounds um, really worth reading. So I thought what I would do would be to turn back to Ambrina and Chiloka um, to two minutes perhaps each on any final reflections arising out of everything else that has been said since, and then give you again, Frida, the final word. So let's take it the opposite order, Chiloka. Uh, reflections of a couple of minutes. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Christine, um, and everyone else. I still beg to differ with Farida about where the best view of Victoria Falls is. Okay. Uh, but two minutes. Um, it was actually the politics uh, of liberation in Southern Africa, including the UDI declaration by um, Rhodesia then, and of um, dealing with liberation movements uh, of refugees and asylum seekers that drove me into international law in the first place as a student uh, at the University of Zambia, because we had to write papers for liberation movements. What's the status of a liberation movement? Is there a right of what pursuit as Rhodesian forces would in uh, would cross in Zambia, uh, apartheid South Africa as well, kill refugees and the students would take blankets to refugee camps, try and, so that memory of a refugee and of the idea of struggle uh, and the use of uh, international law to try and achieve that end uh, never left me uh, at all. So in the context of John and what John has said, and I remember Farida having mentioned Mazimba Muto versus Ladna back, which was mandatory reading in constitutional law uh, at that particular time, uh, a detention case uh, that was dealt by the courts in, um, uh, in Southern Rhodesia. But I'd just like to reinforce, I think, the, the, the power of narrative in conveying messages, um, almost as if their images are in relation to the plight of migrants uh, and refugees, and of course, of the uh, importance of an effective response. I think Farida made the point um, that the countries of origin are as responsible and accountable uh, as are the receiving states, not to mention the transit states um, that are used by, by migrants. So there's a continuing line of accountability uh, and responsibility here. Uh, of the work of special rapporteurs. I think the reports are very interesting. Um, many academics do not read them. I think they're selected academics that read those reports, uh, but they're certainly uh, very, very uh, informative and special procedures in the current climate of human rights. I think it remains the most agile uh, system that, that we have, uh, even if there are pushbacks um, on special procedures as well, but to look into Achuma's work on migrants um, and the issue of self-determination, which didn't come up, self-determination and codependence um, in the context of uh, receiving states, I think is a powerful uh, narrative uh, as well. And I'd just like to end that just as uh, Farida points out to um, the uh, Shakespearean um, story um, of a black woman in it. It reminded me too of uh, Shakespeare's Othello and the Black Moor, um, who was the merchant uh, of, of Venice uh, and clearly of black origin uh, cast in that particular um, story too. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chiloka. And Brida, two minutes. 
I'm just going to finish, Christine, by picking up something that Abdul Paliwala has, has put in the chat, and it's a great question. It always, it always is from Abdul. A question about, should we be thinking about legal pluralism and resistance? And I think I'd want to bring this back to the law school and to our teaching in the law school and to say that we have a responsibility, I think, to, to, to teach law differently and that legal pluralism is mm. one way to do that. And law and literature, certainly in my experience, is a way to do that precisely because uh, you can teach students uh, how, to, how to call into question a legal centralist, their legal centralist education, legal education, and how to how to stand outside of law, how to move to move, to use Chinua Achebe's idea of the mask dancing, how to how how to understand law kinetic qualities by moving outside a legal centralist framework, and that in itself is incredibly powerful to, to, to our students. It's only, it's only a tiny bit of what we can do, but I do think, for example, in a law and literature module, you can achieve that for your students to get them to think differently about law and particularly about their legal education. What, what is it, who is it that decides what is uh, the core, the core of, of, of your legal uh, education? Who is it who decides that uh, immigration law is not core or media law or family law is not core? How, how and teach them that, that all of that is contingent, all of that is down to people making actual decisions. To call into question their legal education in that way, I think is incredibly empowering to students. And I think this book, for, for those of us who want to bring it into the classroom, is such an incredibly strong starting point for, for us, for rethinking our own scholarship, but also for rethinking how we, how we teach. And I'll leave, I'll leave my comments there. Thank you. I also think it's a great starting point for expanding, certainly in my case, at my knowledge of African literature. There's a wonderful reading list there uh, of books to follow up. But I, yeah, I think we could have a much longer discussion about the role of legal education in all of this, which I think would be really interesting to pursue. But unfortunately, we have, well, we're literally on it. So Frida, final word in one minute. Okay. Um, thank you to Sarah Smith, um, who's done all the, in, the work in terms of organizing it. Thank you all for coming. I think we maybe have made the book sound uh, quite depressing. Actually, it's, 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 it's got lots of shafts of humor as uh, the literature reflects and it has an intersectional section on women, LGBTIQ plus and children and all of them are engaged with. And I loved writing the book. And um, thank you to Christine, to John, to everybody, to Ambrina and to Chaloka. Um, thank you very much and thank you all for coming. Um, I appreciate it. Um, I don't think it was a depressing book. I think it was an inspirational book um, in many ways, uh, 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 well, many ways in which you've come up today. And Sarah has actually put into the chat for people who are interested in buying it, the point I made at the beginning that there is currently a 20% discount if you use the discount code capital U, capital G, seven. And I really do recommend it um, that, that you do buy and read the book. And so all it does now is for me to thank you all very much indeed. So John, Ambrina, Chiloka, and of course you, Farida, as well as Sarah for doing all the organization behind the work and all the audience. I'm sorry we didn't get to you um, for asking you questions, but there was so much else that there was to be discussing. And looking at all the comments, I can see that you're all appreciating very much and sending very warm congratulations to you, Farida, for what is a really wonderful effort. So thank you all very much indeed. And yeah, um, that is it. So thank you. just to leave. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.